Hello, and welcome to the CTAC webinar, Tissue Residue Approach to Toxicity Assessment, a Step Forward. I'd now like to go ahead and introduce Bruce Began, the Scientific Affairs Manager for CTAC. Bruce, if you're ready, the floor's all yours. Thanks, Amelia. Let me add my welcome to everybody on today's uh, webinar. I think we've got a great program for you with uh, truly outstanding presenters, and since I want to make sure that we get uh, uh, as much wisdom from them as possible, I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, launch right into today's program. Uh, we've got today's uh, uh, content divided up into uh, four segments. The first part will be uh, given by Jim Metter on uh, the background, some of the basics associated with the tissue residue uh, approach. Uh, we'll then go to uh, Tom Parkerton to uh, talk about the uh, mode of action and the model that's underlying this approach. Uh, the third part will be on some examples to give you a little practical basis for understanding uh, how this approach works and some important factors to consider. And then lastly, Jim will come back and provide some uh, real uh, practical applications of how this uh, approach can be used and, and applied. Today's uh, first section is going to be given by Jim Matter. He's an uh, environmental toxicologist with NOAA out in Seattle, Washington. Uh, he's got over 30 years of experience and, in particular, uh, was the chair of the uh, Pelston workshop that underlies uh, a lot of this methodology. Uh, he also, uh, by the way, is uh, our uh, uh, podcast editor. If you want to uh, find out a little bit more about this uh, approach, you can uh, click over to the CTAC journal site and listen to uh, a, a podcast that Jim's put together. But uh, without further ado, let's uh, get into the meat of today's presentation. Jim? Uh, good morning, or afternoon, or um, actually evening uh, for some of you. Um, I'll start off with a statement that highlights the main feature of the tissue residue approach, kind of a simple um, um, introduction here. Um, as you see from the slide here, the tissue residue approach for toxicity assessment, which often abbreviate as TRA, um, starts with a simple premise that um, states that tissue concentrations are a better surrogate for characterizing toxicity than external exposure concentrations. And this is mainly supported by the guiding assumption for all toxicity tests that contaminant concentrations in the external and internal compartments are proportional to each other and to that at the receptor. Um, as you can see, by eliminating um, the first step, external exposure uh, concentration, we actually get a step closer to the toxic interaction uh, at the receptor, uh, which can be membrane, enzyme, or, or proteins. Uh, each one of these has an associated set of factors causing variability. Uh, so the more variability we eliminate, uh, the more accurate our assessment um, of toxicity for chemi given chemical and set of species uh, will be. The, the true focus in toxicology really centers on the chemical's potency at the receptor. Uh, because it's difficult to observe that interaction, we, we basically rely on predictable relationships uh, between these compartments and use one as a surrogate. The key really is selecting the, um, the best surrogate based on relevance, um, availability, and, and uh, practicality. So first, um, I want to spend a little bit of time on um, a couple of definitions and uh, concepts here just to set the stage. Um, for the tissue residue approach, TRA, we look at doses at uh, three different levels. The first is the external exposure dose, which most of you are very familiar with. This is um, um, water concentration, sediment concentrations, and, and the common metrics, the LC50. P is just proportion, so it can be LC25, EC25, whatever, and it goes, of course, the ANOVA style. Um, metrics for no effect and low effect uh, levels. Next is uh, the administered dose. Um, this can be uh, considered act as an external or an internal uh, dose, depending on the route of administration. Uh, for example, if, if the chemical is injected, it's an internal dose. If it's ingested, it's really an external dose, because only some portion of that is going to be uh, taken up by the animal. And the administered dose um, can be similar or unrelated to the acquired dose, which um, to us is the key, one of the key concepts for the tissue residue approach is the acquired dose. And that is um, based on concentrations measured in whole body, organ uh, specific um, concentrations, or receptor specific concentrations. That's related to um, uh, the toxic response. It's uh, directly associated. 
And here we use a little different terminology for the metrics. We R for residue, tissue residue, so the same sort of um, metrics, LRP, LR50, um, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a few synonyms here. I, I threw in a couple. Uh, LBB is commonly used as lethal body burden. And LAP is from the uh, bi biotic ligand model, or the lethal accumulation also in it as a percentage, usually uh, 50%. So moving on from that, um, I just wanted to um, talk about a few important concepts uh, for toxicity that are relevant to the, the tissue residue approach. First is bioavailability, um, which is, I'm talking about external bioavailability here. And as you all know, this really defines the proportion of the, the total um, contaminant that's available for bioaccumulation. Um, toxicokinetics is also extremely uh, important here. It's basically the rates of uptake and elimination, um, and they're highly variable among species and individuals, depending on um, their inherent abilities and the environmental conditions. Uh, for example, trout have a really high rate of um, uptake, field ventilation, um, compared to other fish, which results in, as you might expect, a high rate of uptake. Um, some species have very high rates of biotransformation, and some organic co compounds um, are highly metabolized, biotransformed, and other species they aren't. So all these are, are important factors to weigh. Um, both of these, uptake and elimination, are really the main determinants for bioaccumulation, and they can be expressed as um, rates or amount per unit uh, time. Uh, the biologically effective dose is also a key concept for the TRA. So this is the amount of um, total toxicant uh, inside the animal that's available to cause a response. Um, for many organics, lipid controls uh, freely available a fraction that can cause toxicity, which is often uh, occurring in, in predictable portions. Uh, for metals, however, this availability is um, really difficult to um, predict and, and work with. And we'll get into some more of this detail later uh, in the webinar. And of course, toxicodynamics is really the potency of the toxicant. And I've listed here a few of the um, uh, factors that um, um, control variability on that. So this little schematic, this bubble diagram, is just kind of um, to show what some of this variability looks like. Um, here on the left you see the um, exposure-based um, uh, metrics, and these are a lot of the factors that we could come up with that um, we think are important for variability. Um, as I said, external, external bioavailability and organismal uh, toxicokinetics are really um, um, quite variable, and as I highlighted there, um, the most important factors to consider in this group. So as we move closer to the receptor, you can see we lose some of these uh, factors and actually um, reduce the variability. Um, So when we evaluate whole body metrics, we still have a number of important factors to consider. However, as you can see, there um, um, a lot of these are less variable overall. And I'm, I'm not going to read through these or discuss these in detail because uh, the three of us will address a lot of these um, in the webinar, the important ones. Uh, anyways, uh, so now I'm going to run through some advantages and um, disadvantages for the tissue residue um, approach for toxicity assessment, TRA. Um, the first point here is that external bioavailability um, is really not an important consideration under the TRA because um, it really doesn't affect tissue metrics as it does for exposure-based um, toxicity. And this can be a really large source of variability when comparing among different um, exposure conditions. Uh, large differences in bioaccumulation among species is also not really um, that important because toxicity is evaluated in terms of the acquired dose, or the total amount bioaccumulated, and it's, it is not the exposure concentration. But for many chemicals, most of the variability among species is a function of their various um, toxicokinetic rates that determine the amount uh, bioaccumulated for a given time period. So that, that one is really a key uh, a feature for TRA. Um, toxicity metrics based on uh, tissue concentrations um, can often be time independent. In fact, in, in a lot of cases, they are time independent, meaning that CBR will be essentially the same um, over time as the BCF and LC50 vary when you're looking at it in terms of exposure uh, concentrations. A common observation for the TRA is that when the tissue concentration achieves a, a critical level, 
uh, response occurs. And so that essentially is producing a metric, a toxicity metric that appears to be a time independent. Um, another important advantage for the TRA is that we can consider classes of chemicals uh, with a common mechanism of action. And the best example I can think of here is um, aryl hydrocarbon uh, receptor agonist, AHR agonist, which includes um, dioxin, furans, uh, coplanar PCBs, and some pHs. And Anne's going to describe this um, example in detail later in the webinar. And related to this is mixer toxicity, um, which is a very important concept for the TRA. So if we can group chemicals that act by a common mechanism of action, uh, we can more accurately consider mixtures, which is, you know, how organisms in the field are exposed to contaminants. So by eliminating bioavailability and reducing differences in bioaccumulation, we can um, really focus on the potency of the mixture and I think better assess the total um, toxic response from uh, multiple chemicals. So continuing on with advantages here, um, the TRA can provide an effective means for assessing um, effects resulting from multiple exposure routes. Um, it basically integrates water, food, and sediment, the, the different routes, uh, particularly for bioaccumulative compounds, organic, organometallic compounds. Um, furthermore, uh, the integration over time and space is, I think, an important advantage. Measurement of tissue residues in native or, say, um, caged animals, experimentally deployed organisms, reduces that temporal and spatial uh, variability and exposure concentrations which in, in most cases is far less expensive than going out and measuring, um, repeatedly measuring um, water and sediment concentrations, for example. Uh, a subset of that is uh, the spatial and temporal integration of uh, pulse exposures. Um, I think the TRA can improve model predictions from a variety of exposure profiles, which can be valuable for assessing risk from uh, short-term fluctuations. Um, an example of this are like episodic um, um, releases, accidental releases, chemical spills, uh, let's see, stormwater runoff, um, pesticide drift runoff, that sort of thing where it's not a constant um, exposure. Um, also, I think the TRA is great for evaluation of animals in the field and uh, biomonitoring. Ideally, we can go in the field and measure tissue concentrations, and we can compare those tissue concentrations to guidelines that we've set up for criteria and have a good idea how close the species is to exhibiting um, adverse effects. Um, if you measure water and sediment concentrations, that requires far more samples and uh, money and really in order to cover the, the large variability that um, uh, usually occurs over time and, and geographic location. Um, we also believe the TRA can help reduce the number of toxicity tests needed to characterize potency. Uh, because the variability in toxicity metrics is highly reduced, uh, we should be able to characterize the contaminant's potency with uh, fewer toxicity tests, which I think is a worthy goal. And for disadvantages, I hate to say it, but there are some, and it's mostly a function of the type of chemicals uh, considered. In general, compounds that are high to metabolize are, are difficult to assess, but um, the key here is to evaluate metabolites and understand their role in, in toxic response. In other words, we all need to know if they're equitox, sorry, equitoxic, more toxic, uh, less toxic, or um, actually don't even contribute at all, which can be a difficult task given the large number of potential metabolites. Um, irreversible toxicants are also very difficult to assess, but I don't think it's impossible. Uh, there is some ongoing work to characterize toxicants, such as organophosphate pesticides, and um, they are doing this through a, like a time-integrated approach. And you can read uh, a lot more of this in the Escher et al. Um, paper in the IEAM issue from January um, of this year. Um, also, reactive toxicants, the ones that are um, um, electrophilic towards uh, DNA and proteins, they don't really exhibit a, a CBR, so we don't, um, we can't consider those. And finally, I, I want to say the TRA can be really difficult to apply to metals, especially invertebrates, which can exhibit um, very high total tissue concentrations and very low amounts that are biologically available. Uh, there's some hope, I think, for fish, though, and I'll show a slide later on. Uh, that kind of highlights that. So we're just listing the major disadvantages here. There's certainly others, and, um, you know, of course we can't really eliminate all variability in assessing chemical toxicity, um, but, you know, there is no single value that can be attained that is applied to all species. So, uh, but this does get us a few steps closer to, um, you know, robust numbers.
And finally, to wrap up part one, I wanted to show this slide. Um, um, these, these are old data, but um, you know they highlight the point that for tissue residue toxicity, we can group toxicants by, by mode of action. And more specifically, if we have data for mechanisms of action, we can focus even more on the class of toxicants and discover how variable uh, toxicity is for that group. So in this slide, um, the top and bottom bars are uh, dioxin up here and uh, baseline narcosis toxicity down here. Those, those are essentially mechanisms. The ones in the middle here are, um, are more modes of action, which are made up of, of multiple mechanisms uh, of action. So even though these modes appear quite variable, they are, um, they're really not what compared to their LC50 counterparts. Um, in, in one of Tom's slides coming up, you'll see that LC50 values for baseline narcotics and pHs um, span about six orders of magnitude. Um, and we considered in terms of tissue concentrations and LR50s, all these chemicals really collapse down to this two to eight uh, micromole per gram range. Then in part two, Tom's gonna um, provide a lot more detail about this aspect of the TRA. Uh, so with that, I'll uh, turn it back over to Bruce. Thanks, Jim. Uh, I think in order to keep us uh, more or less on track, I've gotten several questions on uh, the material that Jim has covered in part one, but I think what we'll do is uh, defer those to the end of the webinar and come back to them. I think we should move into the second portion here, which is going to be presented by Tom Parkerton, who is with uh, ExxonMobil Biomedical Sciences. Uh, Tom's done a lot of work on both uh, uh, products and, and operations and has uh, authored a number of uh, publications relating to this uh, TRA approach. So, uh, Tom, the floor is yours. Thanks, Bruce. <clears throat> I'd like to begin my section of the webinar with a brief introduction to the nonspecific mode of anesthetic action, referred to as narcosis. Now, narcosis involves the perturbation of membrane function that results in decreased activity, such as for example, reduced gill ventilation, heart rate, oxygen consumption. Then it's usually followed by subsequent immobilization and ultimately organism death if the exposure continues. And based on work done in the late 1800s by Mayer and Overton, narcotic effects were found to be applicable across many types of uh, chemicals and that such effects were really characterized as the minimum or baseline level of toxicity that a chemical would exert. It was further observed that narcosis could be produced via different exposure routes. So, for example, if you dose the chemical via air, if you dose the chemical via water, you basically got the same acute narcotic effects. Now, the potency of narcotic effects has also been found to be correlated with a substance hydrophobicity, and that's typically indexed by the substance's log octanol water partition coefficient, at least up until a point above which no effects are, are usually observed. And this idea is depicted in this, in this figure on the bottom of my slide here, in which you see that low molecular weight alcohols that are denoted in this blue color, they partition into this lipid bilayer and they cause adverse effects, whereas a larger, higher molecular weight aliphatic al al alcohol that's denoted in this red color partitions into the membrane, but yet doesn't perturb the membrane function, and as a consequence, you don't see adverse effects. And I think in this next slide, it provides some, some neat experimental data on the inhibition of uh, blue muscle filtration rate that I believe nicely illustrates the points that I made on the previous slide. So let me just quickly walk you through this plot. So on the y-axis is the log of the 48-hour EC50 concentration in water, and that's denoted in blue, or the log of the ER50 in muscle tissue that's denoted in red. So just to orient you, Think water is uh, water-based effect concentrations are shown in blue. Tissue-based effect concentrations are depicted in red. And on the x-axis is the substance's hydrophobicity. And the individual data points, uh, the blue data points, are empirically determined EC50s in waters for different hydrocarbons. And I've got some of the structures just uh, to illustrate uh, some of the compounds that were tested. And you can see that as the log KOW of the water-based EC50 decreases, that these decrease as a function of the octanal water partition coefficient. That's denoted by the blue line. So as the KOW decreases, the toxicity increases. 
In contrast, the 48-hour ER50s that are denoted by the red symbols are relatively constant across log KW, at least up until about a log KW of about six and a half. So that's consistent with the hypothesis of a constant internal membrane concentration corresponding to narcotic effects. But you see that at the higher log KOWs, as denoted by the open triangles in this plot, no effects on muscle filtration rate are observed, despite the fact that the measured tissue concentrations are actually above the ER50s that caused the effects at the, at the lower log KOWs. So consistent with the point that I made on the previous slide, toxicity cutoffs are empirically observed at the solubility limit for hydrophobic substances. Now, based on these kinds of observations, the target lipid model, or TLM for short, was developed to provide a convenient quantitative framework for analyzing aquatic toxicity data sets like we just discussed. The TLM assumes that the adverse effects occur when the concentration in membrane target lipid exceeds a critical threshold, which is referred to as the critical target lipid body burden, or CTLBB for short. Mathematically, the CTLB is just simply the product of the water-based DC50 times the target lipid water partition coefficient, and I've shown that in equation one. Now, if we rearrange that equation, solve for EC50, and then take the logarithms, as shown in equation two, and then we use a linear free energy relationship to the relate the partitioning and target lipid to something that we can measure, octanal water partition coefficient, we can then substitute equation three into equation two to arrive at the equation on the bottom of the slide. And this linear equation expresses the acute toxic response, as defined by the log of the water-based DC50, in terms of both the organism, which is defined in terms of the critical target lipid body burden, and the chemical, which is expressed uh, in terms of the log KOW of the chemical, and then these empirical coefficients A0 and A1. And what those do really is they translate the partitioning into target lipid. They, they give you an estimate of, of the chemicals uh, propensity to, to partition to target lipid. So what this, practically what this means, if you've got EC50 for different substances for your favorite test species endpoint, and you plot the empirical log EC50s for the different substances against the corresponding log KW for those substances, the intercept of that plot provides an estimate of the CTLBB. And the slope of the plot provides an estimate of the A1 term. And further, there's this uh, additional term, the A0 term, that provides a correction factor to account for chemical class-specific differences in partitioning to the target site. So this next slide illustrates the application of the TLM to a number of acute aquatic toxicity data sets. So each plot represents a different species. And on the y-axis is the log of the L or EC50, while on the x-axis is the log of the octanal water partition coefficient. So each green symbol represents an individual EC or LC50 value for a given chemical test species. So it's a measured, measured EC or LC50. And you can see lots of data available for certain species like Daphnia magna, which are commonly, test, commonly tested organisms. Uh, solid lines represent the TLM regressions fit to the empirical data. A couple points that I want to really emphasize in, in, this, in, in this slide. First, you notice that the intercepts of these plots differ, and that simply reflects the sensitivity of the specific species endpoint that is being characterized. Second, I think this is pretty neat, if you examine the lines in these plots, you'll notice that the slopes are remarkably the same. And lastly, I want to point out that the plots terminate at about a log KOW of six, consistent with the observation that acute effects are not observed for these kinds of chemicals with log KOWs above about six. So this, this next slide tries to summarize the results of the TLM analysis to date. TLM regressions have been fit to experimental data sets for about 56 te different test species, and they sort of span the gamut of organism types. It includes amphibians, fish, invertebrates, algae, microbes. It also includes both freshwater and marine species. Uh, this analysis uh, covers over 1,000 acute uh, empirical toxicity tests and several hundred substances, including alcohols, ethers, ketones, as well as aliphatic and aromatic hydrocarbons, and even selected halogenated compounds, such as chlorinated benzenes. And based on this sort of extensive analysis, the A0 term equals zero for many com 
compound classes, but for certain classes, like for example PAHs, a correction factor is required to account for the greater potency that is evident from the empirical toxicity data. So it's been hypothesized that this, likely, this term likely reflects the importance of additional polar interactions on partitioning behavior, at least for certain compound classes. And as already mentioned, the A1 term is constant across uh, species and has been termed uh, the universal narcosis slope. The intercepts from the TLM regressions provide estimates of the species-specific CTLBBs, as I explained. And you can actually use that to define a species sensitivity distribution. And I've illustrated that in the probability plot that I'm going to show on the next slide. So the y-axis of this next plot is the species-specific CTLBBs that we backed out of the intercepts from the TLM regressions, while the x-axis is the cumulative percentile of the CTLBB distribution. The different symbols denote the different types of critters, uh, algae, aquatic, and benthic invertebrates, fish. And you can see that really there's no one type of organism seems to be more or less sensitive, and the overall range in uh, sensitivity across the different species varies from about 30... 30 micromoles per gram octanol, which essentially is assumed to be equivalent to target lipid, to about 600, uh, 600 micromoles per gram octanol. So see, it's a, a variation uh, across all these different species of about a factor of 20. So you might be asking, you know, well, what about that, that, that's acute effects. What about chronic effects? Can you use the TLM to predict chronic toxicity? And the next slide describes how the TL, TLM has been expend, extended to address uh, chronic, chronic tox prediction. And the approach that's used is, is to rely on acute to chronic ratios. And acute to chronic ratio is defined as the short-term L or EC50 value for a given species and chemical divided by the corresponding long-term chronic value for the same test organism and chemical. So um, typically chronic values are defined in terms of either a NOAC or an ECT, EC10 for the most sensitive effect endpoint that's related usually to survival, growth, or reproduction. Those are the relevant population endpoints. The plot on this slide provides a compilation of uh, 29 ACR values across different test species for different types of hydrocarbons. And you can see that the different hydrocarbon classes exhibit a similar range of, of ACR range that varies over about uh, an order of magnitude. And in fact, there's um, it's consistent with larger ACR data sets for a border group of narcotic narcotic chemicals beyond just simple hydrocarbons. I think what's really important to point out is that these ACRs are based on empirical chronic toxicity data. So we're not making any a priori assumptions about the underlying mechanism of chronic toxicity. In other words, we're not assuming that the chronic toxicity is necessarily due to narcosis. So how can one practically apply the TLM? Well, I think one, one neat application is the derivation of water quality criteria for specific chemicals. And I've tried to highlight that in example in this next slide. Uh, as you may be aware, US EPA establishes numerical criteria that are intended to protect aquatic and marine life using the methodology published by Stefan in the mid-1980s. I'll give the reference on the bottom of my slide. The final chronic value is used to define criteria to protect organisms from chronic exposures, and it's done by dividing the fifth percentile of the acute toxicity species sensitivity distribution by the geometric mean acute to chronic ratio for the chemical. And so as an example, during the 1990s, the American Petroleum Institute, they conducted an extensive acute and chronic toxicity testing program for the fuel oxygenate methyl terpyl ether, more commonly known as MP MTBE. And after several years of effort and several hundred thousand dollars of testing, results from this project were used to calculate a final chronic value of 18.1 milligrams per liter. And that was published in ESNT by, by Mancini et al. 2002. For comparison, the TLM can be used to estimate the FCV for MTP given the following information that was brought in the, others in the previous slides, namely the fifth percentile of the CTLB di B distribution, the mean acute to chronic ratio, and simply MTB's log KOW molecular weight. And I've shown uh, just plugging and chugging in the, in the calculation on the slide. Uh, 
And you, you see, using the simple equation, the final chronic value estimate for MTB is 19.2 milligrams per liter, which is an excellent agreement with the value published by Mancini. So I think that this is really a, a really excellent example that highlights the potential time, cost, and animal use savings that can be realized by using the TLM for deriving substance-specific environmental quality objectives. This next slide shows the results of applying this approach to derivation of water quality criteria for polyaromatic hydrocarbons. And you can see that the magnitude of the criteria varies over several orders of magnitude. It's on a log scale here. And that just simply reflects the wide range of log KOW values that are associated with this class of chemicals. And this approach has also been used by EPA to set national equilibrium partitioning sediment quality benchmarks for PAHs. And I'd like to conclude my presentation by briefly touching on a second practical application of the TLM, namely extension to complex mixtures that Jim alluded to earlier in his talk. Uh, this slide illustrates the – let me just uh, advance my slide here – this, this slide illustrates the standard toxicity testing approach that's used to categorize the aquatic hazard of complex substances using the OECD test protocol based on water accommodated fractions. And in this test procedure, WAFs are prepared at different oil loadings and then organisms are exposed to the equilibrated water to determine the aquatic toxicity. And typically it's expressed in terms of a lethal loading. And this next slide provides an overview of the Petrotox model, and this model has been developed by Kinkawi, which is the European Petroleum Industry Association, to predict the aquatic toxicity of complex petroleum substances in these sort of WAF tests. And briefly, given information on petroleum product composition, Petrotox maps the composition to a set of library structures that are then used to simulate the composition of hydrocarbons in the WAF using a WAF exposure model. And the, the WAF exposure model uses sort of first principles, Henry's and Reynolds' law, to describe the distribution of component hydrocarbons within the air, water, and oil phases that comprise the WAF test system that I showed you on the last slide. The predicted exposure concentrations of the WAF hydrocarbons are then normalized by their respective toxicities predicted by the TLM to determine toxic units. And then if we assume that the hydrocarbons act additively in contributing to toxic effects, the toxic effects can then just be a summed across all the different hydrocarbon components in the WAF to determine the overall toxicity. And if the sum of toxic units are greater than or less than one, so here's the convergence criterion, uh, if it's less than or greater than one, you can basically choose a, a different loading and redo the calculation again until you meet the convergence criterion of one. So if, if you're interested in learning more about the Petrotox model, you can see the link that I've provided at the bottom of the slide. You can also sign up for the short course that's going to be offered at CTAC Boston. And my last slide, uh, this illustrates the use of the Petrotox framework in describing the acute toxicity of gasoline. So on the y-axis is the observed acute effects expressed in percent. On the x-axis is the sum of the toxic units in WAF based on gasoline composition and the Petrotox model calculation. And the different colored symbols represent toxicity test data for Daphne efficient algae across different gasoline samples. And you can see that, as expected, the empirical dose-response relationship is centered around one toxic unit, at least providing a preliminary validation of this framework for predicting the aquatic toxicity of various gasoline samples. So this concludes my portion of the webinar, and at this point, I'll turn it back over to Bruce. Thanks, Tom. Uh, I think we've got time for maybe one quick question before we move into the third part of our webinar. Uh, and I've got one here. How does the susceptibility of a chemical to metabolism influence the applicability of the TLM? Well, I, I think it depends, but in, in many cases, chemicals that are well recognized to be metabolism nicely fit the TLM paradigm. So, for example, uh, alcohols and aromatic hydrocarbons, which are readily metabolized by fish, are included in a, a number of the TLM regressions that I, that I showed. So, what this suggests is that, at least in, in many cases, the metabolites are contributing to the effects that are observed. And I think Anne will present some, some nice data to support this idea in, in her talk.
Thanks, Tom. I think that's a nice uh, segue into our next uh, segment here, which is going to be presented by Ann McElroy. Uh, Ann also has uh, more than 30 years of experience uh, looking at bioaccumulation, metabolism, and uh, effects of organic compounds, and she's on the faculty at uh, Stony Brook University in New York. Ann? Thanks, Bruce, and greetings, everyone. In my section of the webinar, I'm going to give you some examples of single compounds and mixtures of compounds where the TRA has been successfully applied and point out some of the factors that must be considered when applying TRA. A good example of a TRA application is the TEF-TEQ approach for dioxins, furans, and more recently, PAHs. These compounds can all elicit toxicity through direct interaction with the aryl hydrocarbon receptor, or AHR. Toxic equivalency factors, or relative toxicity factors, have been empirically determined from lab studies based on tissue residue analysis or in vitro studies. And with these factors in hand, the contribution of individual congeners to toxicity and the cumulative toxicity of mixtures of these compounds can be addressed, where the toxic equivalent, or TEQ, is calculated as the sum of the individual congener concentrations times their TEF and summed over the, the list of the chemicals you're looking at. Shown here are examples of toxic equivalency factors for representative dioxins, furans, and PCBs, or relative potency factors for PAHs determined for mammals, fish, and birds. The TEFs are all set relative to 2378 tetrachlorodibenzodioxin, or TCBD, the most potent member of the group, and they're set for, to one for each, each comparison. As you can see, the potency ranges for just uh, examples of these compounds by about six orders of magnitude, uh, with uh, the dioxins tending to be most import, uh, potent, the furans less potent, the PCBs less potent still with the exception of the coplanar PCBs, with the PAHs generally being least potent, uh, reflecting the degree to which these compounds induce the AHR. Initially set up for mammals, with some exceptions, TEFs for fish and birds are similar, pointing out the applicability of this approach. Some exceptions are here for um, uh, PCB77, where birds are more sensitive, um, uh, benzocafluorensine, where the fish are more sensitive, um, and uh, uh, this tetrachlorodipenzofuric where the um, fish are more sensitive. For mixtures of compounds acting via similar mechanisms, this approach is very effective. Effort is currently underway to develop similar scheme for PCBs acting as neurotoxicants, and this approach is sometimes used with compounds acting via the estrogen receptor. This slide shows an example of how relative potency was used to calculate TEQs for AHR agonists in sediment and various trophic levels of organisms collected from the Ariake Sea in Japan in a paper by Nakata. Their data show that a wide range of PAHs contribute uh, uh, to the TEQ of sediments and still dominate the key TEQ for a benthic species, the clam, and contribute significantly to the TEQ of another benthic species, the crab. But as you move up into these more pelagic or and higher trophic level organisms, the PCBs quickly uh, start to dominate the TEQs with these more pelagic top consumers uh, having their TEQ predominantly um, with the non-ortho PCBs. The relative importance of PCBs versus PAHs in the higher consumers is most probably linked to their ability to m rapidly metabolize PAHs. But this study also demonstrates that at least in these lower trophic level benthic organisms, that PAH toxicity should not be ignored. This is a nice example, I think, of how TRA can be used in a forensic mode to evaluate the potential contribution of accumulated residues to toxicity. Best known, for, best known, as Tom discussed earlier, for compounds acting, acting as narcotic or baseline toxicants, TRA has also been successfully applied in a number of other cases with compounds or groups of compounds known to act by specific mechanism, 
Just some examples of these are listed here. I just talked about dioxins and furans and PCBs. The TRA-based DEQ calculations have been very effective in this group in dealing with a large group of compounds with widely varying potencies. Chlorophenols act by uncoupling electron transport, and the TRA here works well despite the fact that these compounds can be metabolized and is another good example of the application of TRA to mixtures. I'll show you some data on this in the next slide. Methylmercury binds to sulfhydryl groups, causing widespread cellular damage. The EPA ba uh, TRA based criterion of 0 0.3 micrograms per gram protects both fish and human consumers of this highly bioaccumulative compound. Organophosphates inhibit acetylcholinesterase activity, and although binding is not always reversible, toxic residue relationships tend to be much less variable than media based relationships. Tributyl tins act by uncoupling oxidated phosphorylation, but in some species also can act as endocrine disruptors. TBD data shows relatively low variance for uh, critical body residues when thin specific types of endpoints, such as mortality, growth, or imposex, and we will be showing you some more data on this later as well. The biotic ligand model, or BLM, has been shown to accurately predict acute ionoregulatory toxicity of metals in fish based on accumulated concentrations in their gill tissue. And finally, selenium is present in many forms with widely varying bioavailability in the environment, but the TRA-based EPA criterion of 7.9 micrograms per gram in fish has been shown to be protective against early life stage toxicity. This next slide shows uh, data for chlorophenols from um, uh, pulp mill effluent. And uh, similar da data is available on many, many chemicals where lethal body burdens based on tissue uh, residue analysis, as shown here in the open circles, tend to be much less variable than body burdens based on media beta concentrations such as the LC50 here shown in the closed signals. And you can see the data here for 13 different chlorophenols across three different fish species and one invertebrate species that the media base LC50s vary here uh, by four orders of magnitude, while the tissue-based uh, LR50s vary by less than a factor of 10. This gives you an LR50 uh, uh, with only a 10% uh, coefficient of variation. And for compounds where this works, this approach allows you to predict toxicity from one uh, member of the group to the other, chlorophenols in this case, and to predict toxicity across different species. This next slide shows similar data for tributyl tin. The figure on the left here shows media-based LC50s as a species sensitivity distribution with the more sensitive species um, uh, on the bottom, and as you can see, the LC50s range from a factor of about, oops, my cursor is not moving, by a factor of um, uh, 400 for different species of fish and invertebrates. Uh, on the right here, this figure shows the LR50s, the residue-based toxicity values for the individual species, this time shown as a horizontal bar plot. Uh, by doing this, variance is decreased um, significantly by a factor of 10, so now uh, you only get a fourfold variance between the different, um, the different species, uh, giving a much more robust measure of average toxicity. Now I'd like to point out a couple main factors that can confound the application of TRA. Uh, and due to time, time constraints, I'm only going to be able to talk about the first in any kind of detailed metabolism. But uh, tissue residue values are often normalized to, to lipid body burdens, as Jim uh, mentioned earlier, and there uh, are some things that need to be considered there. And as Jim also mentioned, particularly with metals and invertebrates, sequestration within the body uh, can result in much higher body burdens without associated related toxicity. The next slide uh, illustrates uh, some data uh, on, on metabolism. 
And as many of you probably know, most species of fish and many species of invertebrates can metabolize organic contaminants. Shown here are some data on the relative ability of different small invertebrates to metabolize the model pH benzoate pyrene determined by radioisotope analysis. As you can see, the degree of metabolism is difficult to predict even among closely related species. Uh, with on the left here for polychaetes, the amount remaining as parent compound varying from over 90% to less than 10% just within this one group. Bivalve mollusks, which are generally thought to have no or limited availability to metabolize PAHs, uh, can also not necessarily be predicted. And the three groups looked at here, one of them uh, metabolized over 40% of accumulated body burdens. Uh, so while metabolites are generally thought not to contribute to toxicity, this is not necessarily the case. Known examples are oxon metabolites of organophosphate pesticides, reactive metabolites of PAH, as Jim also mentioned. And as I'll show in a few minutes, uh, uh, some metabolites appear to show additive toxicity with their parent compounds. Next slide. Shown here are uh, uh, more data from that same study, which shows bio how metabolism influences bioaccumulation. And the graph here shows bioaccumulation presented as sediment-normalized bioaccumulation factors, or BAFs, from the same study uh, plotted against the percent uh, metabolism shown on the last slide. And as you can see in the closed symbols, uh, the data are presented for the be parent benzopyrene alone, and the BAFs decrease uh, significantly, and this is a log scale, so they increase by, um, uh, uh, by quite a bit, uh, uh, being uh, low, much lower in organisms that can metabolize benzopyrene well, the bioaccumulation factor is based on total radioactivity, in this case benzopyrene plus its metabolites, are relatively constant. So if we just uh, looked at total radioactivity here and thought we were looking at just parent BAP, uh, this analysis would have dramatically overpredicted body burdens, and um, uh, uh, which would influence toxicity uh, uh, residue relationships. Uh, so this, these data point out the need to evaluate metabolic potential and the toxicity of metabolites. The next slide shows some data pulled together by Tom uh, uh, showing target lipid model predictions as well as empirically determined uh, critical body residues for two, two, PAA, two compounds, one that is not metabolized, pentachlorobenzene and the Xs, and another fluorinthine that can be metabolized. And uh, shown in the slide, uh, the, the open diamonds are the prediction from the target lipid model. And as you can see, both pentachlorobenzene and total fluorinthine, that would be parent plus metabolites, follow the TLM very closely. But if you just looked at parent um, phenanthrene, particularly in the lower left-hand side of the curve there, you can see uh, that the parent does not significantly over-predicting toxicity at lower concentrations, thus indicating that in this case at least, metabolites are contributing to toxicity probably in, in some sort of additive way. So the next slide summarizes uh, some of the uh, issues related to metabolism and uh, I think points out that metabolism um, probably remains one of the most difficult issues in applying the TRA, at least to organic contaminants. Ignoring metabolites can lead to either over- or under-representing toxicity. Even when not using radio tracers, ignoring metabolites can be pr problematic if they contribute to toxicity. Now, quantifying body burns and metabolites can is relatively easy done when you're using radioisotopes, but new methods are needed to assess metabolism of unlabeled compounds. In the past, people have looked at things like biofluorescence as a measure of PAH metabolites. Uh, more recent studies have used techniques such as canning, scanning um, confocal microscopy to look at fluorescent uh, metabolites within the body. And newer liquid chromatography mass spectral techniques uh, can be used to directly measure metabolites. Once we have these better methods in hand, the toxicity of metabolites uh, 
themselves needs to be addressed. The next slide uh, goes on to point out some factors to consider when applying t TRA uh, with lipid normalization. And uh, normalizing accumulated body burdens to total, total lipids has been shown to generally reduce variability as well, but I'd like to point out that all lipids are not created equal. There are two major classes of lipids in the body, neutral or storage lipids, um, uh, and uh, such as triglycerides, sterols, wax extras, or cholesterol, and polar lipids, such as phospholipids, free fatty acids, or lipoproteins. Generally, membrane lipids are the target for toxicity, toxicity, while storage lipids are what is quantified. Now, storage lipid reservoirs can, in some cases, act to buffer toxic effects, leading to higher CBRs in individuals with higher lipid content. Reservoirs of storage lipids also change temporally with reproductive status, age, and season, which can affect body burdens and delivery of toxicants to specific tissues. But probably from an application standpoint, one of the most important things to consider is that different methods quantify these pools of lipids differentially. So it is very important to use comparable method, methods when employing lipid normalization and to understand what you are getting. A broad polarity extraction technique, such as blind dye, will give you a very different result than a hexane extraction. So in the next slide, to summarize, it's very important to make sure methods are reported when you're normalizing to lipid to ensure data comparability. And looking forward, it would be best to start evaluating toxicity associated with lipid classes. Uh, there's some data suggesting that normalization to triacylglycerols uh, generally uh, improves um, or reduces uh, variability. Uh, and finally, we need to determine which is the best surrogate for dose at the site of toxic action. And this is likely to differ for contaminants acting in different ways. So with this, I'll uh, hand it back to Bruce. Thanks, Ann. That really helped to amplify on a number of the points that uh, Jim and Tom made. I've got a number of questions on Ann's portion of the webinar, but I think we'll defer those to the end to allow Jim to come back in here uh, gives us some information on applications, and we'll come back at the end and, and uh, respond to some questions that you've all posed. Jim? Okay, now a few um, applications. Uh, there's really many applications for the tissue residue approach, and I've listed a few of the major ones here, actually. Sorry, I need to change the slide. Uh, one strong feature of the um, TRA is the development of tissue quality guidelines or criteria that are um, can be based on uh, dose response relationships. You can also translate those tissue guidelines into equivalent water and sediment guidelines, uh, which does introduce some variability, but does maintain the scientific um, defensibility because the responses are generated from a causal mechanism, a dose response, if you will. Um, and I'll go into some of that in a, in a few minutes here. Uh, the TRA can also be used in forensic analysis. This is a really important for um, Acute events such as chemical spills and other cases um, where long-term toxicity is a concern. Uh, you know, often you have dead animals in hand and you can use the tissue residue concentrations uh, to confirm suspicions about potential causes. And also on the flip side, in some cases you can rule out some chemicals if they're um, really not high enough to cause um, effects that you've uh, figured out previously in, in research. Um, a logical application for the, the TRA course is ecological risk assessment, or actually any of evaluation of contaminant harm, such as uh, Superfund site evaluations, uh, natural resource damage assessment, endangered species consultations, et cetera. Uh, in general, we like to think the, the tissue residue um, approach um, is really just another line of evidence that's complementary to um, a lot of the exposure toxicity assessment that's done for, for site evaluations. Um, I'm going to show a couple of other examples here and um, kind of discuss um, tissue quality guidelines. Um, in this analysis, I plotted uh, DDX values, which is basically the sum of DDT, DDE, and DDD uh, compounds measured in tissue for fish that were exposed to technical grade uh, DDT. Uh, in many of these cases, these are um, LOER values. Um, but some are point estimates, for example, uh, LR50s. Um, as you can see, the uh, species sensitivity distribution for these studies is uh, fairly tight. 
with most of the responses occurring in um, this 1 to 10 ppm whole body um, concentration range. So this is a fairly good sized database that allows us to, to calculate a fifth percentile value with um, actually a fairly tight 95% confidence interval. Um, so this is often termed the um, hazard concentration, fifth percentile, or HCO5. Um, you could calculate other percentiles uh, depending on your application, um, the statute that you're working under. Um, this HCO5 um, could be used as a tissue quality guideline that um, would be used in risk assessment, for example. Um, however, in analysis such as this one, we're dealing with um, effect concentrations, sometimes quite severe, and you got a lot of mortality values here. Um, therefore, these values really should be lowered um, only to a low occurrence uh, toxicity or no effect level. And you can do this with various uh, safety factors or um, ECRs and things like that. Um, it's really kind of a wide open area on that. Um, and ideally, I want to say that the species sensitivity distribution should be generated separately uh, by endpoint, for example, um, just for mortality and uh, uh, a narrow group of taxa like just for fish and, um, and for a given response metric like uh, LR50. You know, mixing these really produces a lot of unwarranted variability. However, in this case, uh, for example, um, the variability wasn't really greatly increased by adding um, a lot of these points, which does help um, the power here. So the next one I want to show is um, copper, as I mentioned before, or metals in general. Um, and this is just for fish. Um, and this is, I think, to highlight the observation that in some cases it may be useful. Um, there's few data here. Um, but the, the, the available metrics do show that there's um, actually pretty low variability for toxicity as, as a function of whole body copper. Uh, for these particular endpoints. Um, you can see impaired growth kind of grouped separately and mortality and behavior grouped over here, which is a bit of a surprise, but um, I think this really illustrates that some species ex exhibit differences in sensitivity. But, you know, these few ppm uh, between the different endpoints is really quite minor. Um, and in a lot of cases, you know, the results are really dependent on several factors, such as analytical chemistry, um, uh, the way the statistical analysis is done, the endpoint in particular, and um, uh, experimental conditions. So, you know, given all these studies, I think it would be safe to say that uh, when whole body concentrations um, in fish in approach about a 3 to 4 ppm uh, whole body concentration, you can expect severe effects. Uh, consequently, um, this HCO5 or even a somewhat lower value um, that would be more protective could be used as a tissue quality guideline. Uh, for whole body uh, concentrations in fish. Uh, another important feature for the uh, tissue residue approach is that this, the CBR, for example, um, LR50, ER50, whatever, is uh, directly related to the same metric based on exposure concentrations like the LC50. And the common link here is the bioaccumulation factor. Um, if you know two of these metrics, you can determine the third just by mathematical manipulation. Um, as many of you know, the BCF is just tissue divided by water, so you can kind of see how the terms uh, would cancel out. Um, and this equation can also be solved for different time periods as long as the um, exposure-based metrics, the LC15 and the BCF in this case, are uh, time-matched, in other words, for the same duration of exposure. Um, so consequently, this, I think, is very useful for data mining. Uh, for example, in many publications, the authors will report an LC50 and a BCF, and by simple math manipulation, you can calculate the equivalent LR50. Um, an important point here I wanted to, to show is that this is that feature of time independence. As the, um, the BCF is increasing, the LC50 is going down, they're inverse, and the CBR is basically a, a constant function. So here's the, the, the point where we're converting a, a tissue quality guideline and um, back to a sediment or a water concentration, uh, which is something uh, you want to do for, for some applications. Uh, for sediment, uh, the BSAF is a, is a good approach because um, for many organic compounds, it, it really integrates over all exposure routes and uh, reflects the proportionality between uh, sediment, water, and prey concentrations. Um, 
So for these equations, we start with a tissue quality guideline that we've determined uh, previously, um, as I showed a few slides back here. So for the bioaccumulation factor of interest, the BCF or BSAF or whatever you're using, you can choose a 95th percentile of all values um, they determined by an SSD style um, analysis. Or you can select the value that's uh, you know most closely associated with the species that is, that is at that fifth percent um, tile for toxicity, or even a theoretical QSAR value such as uh, maximum BSAF. And I should say these equations work um, for metabolized compounds such as uh, TBT, which is uh, the next example. Uh, in theory, the uh, water quality guideline determined with this equation um, using a, a tissue quality guideline is really inherently similar to the standard approach used by um, our US EPA to develop water quality criteria using the water exposure data. So if enough data are available, the uh, two values will likely be pretty similar. So um, in this example, I selected the most sensitive endpoint for DT, uh, the Imposex uh, CBR, which is uh, 0.6 ppm. So selecting the 95th percentile uh, uh, BCF for all these seawater species uh, gives a value of 2,000 or 12,600, uh, which is very close to the BCF values that observed for those snails that are um, susceptible to imposex. So plugging all this into the equation here, I get a value of 4.7 nanograms per liter. And this value is actually relatively close to the EPA's uh, chronic water quality criteria for um, TBT and seawater, seven parts per billion or nanograms per liter, parts per trillion, sorry, um, which is based on a large number of toxicity values. So the tissue guideline here, which is based on five species, and exhibits actually very low variability. The coefficient of variation is less than 50% on that. Um, actually confirms a water-derived criteria that has been determined from dozens of experiments. So now I'll show um, a simple example for uh, sediment conversion. Um, and I'm going to use the basic uh, baseline uh, toxicity example here um, for lethal responses, which, um, as Tom has showed, occurs in the two to eight micromole per gram uh, wet weight range. Um, so here I'm using a maximum BSAF of four. So in the previous slide, we just kind of uh, run the equation here. And um, um, using this BSAF of four is just kind of like a default value, a starting value, um, especially when there's no other bioaccumulation available. You know, sometimes it's, um, it's a bit higher. I've seen um, a lot of measurements where it's over four. Frequently, it's a lot lower due to the lack of equilibrium as a result of insufficient time for uh, bioaccumulation or more specifically a metabolism is a big factor here. So with these equations we really now just need the lipid content for um, some species and of interest and um, organic carbon and sediment. And on the right side here I've supplied uh, some common values. So as you see, you know, we run the equation and we get a value of 25 um, micromoles per gram organic carbon which can be used by itself as, as a value. Um, and just to show that in terms of dry weight, it works out to be about 100 ppm. And that, of course, is assuming um, an average molecular weight of about 200 Daltons, which um, fits a lot of uh, small organic compounds like PAHs. Um, so of course, this is, you know, for lethal response and the adjustments um, would really have to be made for, um, you know, low effects values and, or no effect, depending on, on uh, what your application is. And I should also point out that you know all the chemicals in sediment that can produce this baseline um, toxicity and bioaccumulate according to equilibrium partitioning can be added together to get one value. So therefore, this this 100 ppm value would be for all such chemicals in the sediment, uh, not just one individually. And this is where the the mixture um, toxicity aspect comes in. So finally. Um, I want to wrap up with some recommendations for improving and utilizing uh, the tissue residue approach. In uh, most toxicological evaluations, a uh, substantial database is really needed for accurate assessments. And as you've seen, there's a number of um, contaminants of concern uh, with data, but you know a lot of important chemicals that we're interested in, we really don't have the detailed uh, data uh, for risk assessments. So we, you know, we recommend data mining, as, as one example mentioned earlier. And, um, you know, there's a large amount of data out there that could be explored for uh, tissue residue metrics, but, you know, a lot of people just haven't looked. 
Um, I think adding tissue concentrations to standard toxicity tests would be a huge improvement um, in our ability to um, acquire much-needed data. Um, it would make testing, you know, much more expensive, but I think in the overall picture of things, it, it's mostly labor, so adding um, some chemical analysis to your um, replicates and all that would um, would be a good thing and actually add quite a bit of data. Um, I think the lack of evaluation for mixture toxicity is one of the, the major deficiencies we currently face in toxicity assessment and environmental protection. Um, this is a situation animals experience in most cases in the field, and frankly, we just avoid it. Um, it's too hard many times. So you know, I think the tissue residue um, approach and the metrics can really help assess toxicity due to mixtures. Um, especially for those we consider additive. Um, also, we'd like to highly recommend including tissue residue toxicity um, in risk assessments. And this is slowly catching on. And it's, as far as I know, it's been used in at least um, three uh, Superfund sites in the US, a few endangered species uh, consultations, and a couple natural uh, resource damage assessment um, um, evaluations. And finally, I want to say that um, the tissue residue toxicity approach is not intended to replace any of the current approaches or methods that we commonly employ in risk assessment or criteria development. Um, but it should become one more line of evidence for characterizing toxicity. In some cases, the tissue-based information will be superior um, to exposure-based values, and it really should be weighed accordingly. So I just wanted to say thanks for listening. Uh, we hope this has uh, been informative and useful for you and that um, we've inspired you to Consider using tissue residue toxicity in your research um, or even as an uh, assessment tool. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Bruce uh, for the wrap-up. Thanks, Jim. Uh, we're running a little bit behind, but there's one question that came in on Ann's portion that I, I think it's important that we uh, try to get some information on, and that is how do you reconcile the TRA approach for compounds that may act via multiple mechanisms? Well, I think... Uh there, there is a number of ways to to do this. It's, of course, you need to recognize it. But if looking back at um, at either uh, the TLM uh, predictions or that that slide Jim showed earlier, showing the ranges for different uh, uh, data observed for different types of toxicants, uh, if you get values that are are widely off these predictions, it's it's a good indicator that, that you're dealing with multiple mechanisms or a different mechanism, and this can inform further work to, to look for those or to separate them. But I think some of the early um, criticisms of the TRA method were when people were lumping data on different mechanisms. So you need to um, look for compounds that are, that are acting in similar ways, and, then, and if it's unknown, then compare your data to, to the preponderance of data, and if, if there's an indication that something else is going on, then that uh, you can pursue that. Okay, thanks. That was helpful. With that, I want to thank our presenters for their uh, uh, information that they've uh, provided today. I think it's a lot of information. Uh, I also want to uh, thank our attendees, uh, particularly those who have stuck around to the end of this, and, and uh, want to mention, in addition to the handout that's downloadable, uh, that if you go to the uh, IEAM uh, journal page on ctech.org that there's a whole series of papers uh, that came out of the Pelson workshop that are available uh, for uh, access free through the end of this year. And with that, I'm going to turn things back over to Amelia. Perfect. Thank you so much, Bruce. Um, and on behalf of CTAC, I do just want to thank everybody for, do for joining us today and for your participation. And I also do just want to give a big thank you to our speakers for their uh, excellent presentation today. Uh, at this time, you will see that I've brought a survey up on the screen, and we'd love it if you'd take a moment and provide some feedback uh, before you shut down today. We certainly do appreciate any feedback that you can provide in order to help improve future webinars. Again, thank you so much for joining us. We hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. This does conclude today's session. You may now go ahead and disconnect. Inform